During, uh, so Monica wants to know, during the beginning of perimenopause, can you start having um, swollen, puffy, achy hands, which may be menopausal arthritis? No such thing as menopausal arthritis. Somebody told you a line, a hook line on that. Um, if you've got swollen, puffy hands and feet uh, in arthritic pain, you've got something that is irritating your body you need to get it checked out, Monica. I'd recommend working with somebody who understands functional nutrition. Um, Shai is asking about EMFs affecting mold. Yeah, EMFs in, enhance mold growth. There have been a number of studies that show that the, the, if, you've lived in, if you've got mold in your environment and you have a lot of EMF in your environment, EMFs actually enhance how well mold can grow. So EMFs, not good. So a lot, a lot of times that puffiness, I'll just come back to that a little bit, the puffiness, the swelling, this is B6, or it can be. B6 is a natural diuretic. It helps also in the project, pr production of progesterone. In a lot of women going into perimenopause, there, there's a shift in estrogen and progesterone, and some of them become a little bit more estrogen dominant, and that's where that can come from. So some women find B6 very helpful as well. Uh, what do I suggest to help regain the smelling ability? Um, a little more time, but, but if you're trying supplementally to try to improve, zinc and quercetin, just at higher doses. So I'd say, you know, with zinc, upwards of 100, 125 milligrams of quercetin or uh, of zinc, and then, you know, anywhere between one and three grams a day of quercetin, um, along with uh, breathing, essential oil breathing, to help, um, to help stimulate the olfactory nerves. And, and some people I've seen also do well in that regard with the loss of smell with, um, with alpha lipoic acid. Yeah, so I wake up thirsty with hot flashes. If I drink, I pee all night. If I don't, I can't sleep. Now I gain four pounds because I don't sleep. Um, you got a deeper problem, most likely, Nancy, and so that you really probably ought to follow up with somebody and get kind of a, a deeper biochemical work I've done uh, because, you know, that's a catch-22, right? Thirsty, you need to drink. You can't drink because you pee. You can't, you can't sleep either way. You got to get it figured out because if you're not sleeping, um, you're going to have a problem. Stacy asked, I'm always told that calcium is not a good supplement to take because it can build up in your arteries. No, I mean, it can, but generally calcium doesn't build up in your arteries. Calcium just doesn't say, hey, the artery is my favorite place to hang out. Where, where calcium ends up in your arteries if you have infl inflamed blood vessels. So if you're eating poorly, um, a, a, you know, sugar, hydrogenated oils, if you're gluten sensitive and, and your blood vessels are inflamed, your body will deposit calcium in those patches of inflammation in an effort to try to basically patch over that blood vessel, but that's not because you're just using calcium in general. Calcium deposits in arterial linings or walls are not as a result of taking calcium supplements unless you have some major pituitary gland problems or, or um, parathyroid gland problems. That, that, shouldn't, you know, that, that shouldn't happen just in general from taking calcium supplementation. If magnesium is good for sleep, how much can you safely take with stage three kidney disease? I mean, you should be fine. You always ask your nephrologist, but um, you know, you know, if you're talking about a little bit of magnesium before bed, two, 300 milligrams should be perfectly fine, even if you have stage three. Um, I think the bigger question there, Barb, is why do you have stage three kidney disease? What is it that you're doing that's contributing to your kidneys not working and failing? Um, you know, because I've seen stage three and stage four reverse with diet change in people. And so again, going back to why, why is that the case? That's a, to me a more important question. Um, let's see here, is vitamin K required with vitamin D? No, um, but you can take them together. It's certainly not, not a bad thing. A lot of people talk, have been talking about how if you don't take vitamin K and vitamin D together, then you'll cause calcium buildup in the arteries. 
because vitamin K helps calcium make it where it's supposed to go, which is in your bone and as an electrolyte. But that's not 100% true. I mean, I, I've, I, I'm, a, I'm a fan more of the test than I am of the guess. And so I, I've seen more than 10,000 people with vitamin D deficiency uh, and probably more than half of those individuals, I didn't use vitamin K and they were just fine and they corrected their vitamin D deficiency and they went on to become healthier and do better without vitamin K. So it's not a requirement. I think if you don't run testing to see whether or not you're low or not, it's not a bad idea to take them together. But if you're running tests and you're, let's say you're not deficient in vitamin K, but you are deficient in vitamin D, you don't necessarily need to take extra K with the D. Okay. And we go down a little on the right. A little bit more. Okay, there it is. So, but how would we stop our blood sugar from dropping while we sleep? One of the best ways to get good, stable blood sugar is to make sure that you're not deficient in the micronutrients that regulate it. So going back to what I said earlier, magnesium, chromium, zinc, or bar none, super critical and important for regulating blood sugar. A lot of people with, with those deficiencies and vitamin D as well, um, well, they don't regulate their blood sugar very well because of those deficiencies. So again, a good place to start would be looking and measuring for those deficits. Outside of that, looking at your diet. Um, some people's diets are poor, and so their blood sugar is elevated on average because they have poor diets and they have low muscle tone. You need good muscles to maintain blood sugar, but you also need a good diet. And, and, and that can be different for different people. I mean, I've seen cases where some people ate, you know, what would be considered a low sugar, low glucose, low glycemic food, and it spikes their blood sugar. Everybody's a little different in that regard. Good food source of zinc, um, any meat. Any meat is a good source of zinc. Zinc comes in, in a lot of different meats and nuts as well. Yeah, so somebody, somebody mentioned that, um, let's see here, acid reflux led to confirmed diagnosis of celiac disease, took myself off of protonics and started on a probiotic yogurt, very little acid reflux ever since. I like hearing that. That, that makes perfect sense. Um, a lot of times, member gluten can disrupt the microbiome and it can be a cause of, of acid reflux. And, uh, and probiotics can be very, very helpful. There are a number of studies that have shown that the right, you know, the right types of bifidobacteria and lactobacillus can be very helpful at, at reducing the symptoms of acid reflux in people with gluten sensitivity. Supplements that help with mold. Deborah, the number one thing you can do if you've got a mold problem is get out of the mold. Um, all the supplements in the world won't fix the poisoning. It's kind of like, you know, if mold is your problem and you don't get out of it, you can take vitamins, you can take minerals, you can take binders, but you're just spinning your wheels and you're spending a lot of money on supplements that are probably not going to have a very good outcome for you. I do have supplements that help with mold, that being said, but again, before you used any of them, I would highly suggest getting out of the mold if you're not already. Um, one of the things we use is a binder called uh, Mycobinder, Mycobinder Plus, and it's um, a mixture of different things like zeolite and charcoal and fulvic acid. It can be very, very helpful as a binding agent. And we also use other things for mold. Some of the most helpful things be like alpha lipoic acid, um, as well as vitamin C, 
uh, very, very helpful if you're trying to recover from, from mold exposure, from chronic you know, mold exposure. Uh, and a number of other things, but I would really suggest if you're struggling in that arena to really follow up with somebody who knows how to guide you. Is too much B6 toxic? In very, 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 look, I've been practicing 21 years, Amelie, and I've seen one case of B6 toxicity, one. And I've used high doses of B6 in thousands and thousands of people. So can it be toxic? Yes. Is it common? Extremely uncommon. Let's see. How much chromium needed per day? If you're trying to control your blood sugar, you know, it depends on your height and weight and everything else. But a good place to start is, is two, anywhere between two and, and 600 micrograms a day is a, is a decent place to, to begin the process there. How do you know if you have mold? You get tested. Karen, and there's different ways to get tested, but you first and foremost test yourself because if you have somebody like a mold inspector come out, a lot of times they're lazy, they don't know what the hell they're doing. Uh, you know, you need a weekend seminar to get a mold inspector license, um, and so a lot of these folks are, you know, the blind leading the blind, uh, and you don't want to spend a bunch of hundreds of dollars having a mold inspection done and get a false negative uh, or false sense of security about whether or not you have an issue. This is working with a doctor that can test you directly for mold. And that, and that you know, there's, there's a lot of different tests for mold. Um, and most of them, you know, a lot, a lot of doctors will run a battery of tests where you're looking at, you know, um, MSH. Uh, there's another one called transforming growth factor beta one and there, there's other ones like mmp there and and so these tests are being used by a lot of doctors as you have mold but that's not what these tests mean these tests don't mean if they're positive right these tests don't mean you have mold these tests mean that you have chronic inflammation it's a lot of things that cause chronic inflammation a lot of things and it's not that these tests can't be helpful, but in the reality is, is they're not specific to mold. And so maybe that those tests are elevated because you have chronic inflammation because you're not gluten free or because you're allergic to dairy or because you're reacting to sugar or because you're reacting to some other uh, umpteen different foods that you might be eating that are driving the inflammatory process. So these, again, when it comes to mold, you don't ever want to run tests that are nonspecific because they require a degree of guesswork. And when it comes to mold, you know what the reality of mold is, if you got mold in your house that's poisoning you and killing you slowly, you need to understand exactly whether or not it's mold. If you run a bunch of nonspecific tests, you don't know exact. You don't know whether mold is part of your problem or not. You speculate. It's a hell of a hard decision to make whether you should leave your house or stay in your house based on speculative testing. So you gotta get super accurate and run the right kinds of tests that are specific for whether you're in mold. And, and the, one of the best is to run, ask your doctor or to run a test that measures mycotoxins. Mycotoxins, because if you're overloaded with mycotoxins, specific ones in particular, um, you've got a mold problem. If you're not, you, you probably don't have a mold problem. And so, but it's important to work with a doctor if you're going to do this, who understands mycotoxins, understands um, provocation of mycotoxins, under, understands which types of tests to look at here which ones actually to run because there are different types of mycotoxins that can be measured. And so, you know, again, working with somebody who knows what the hell they're talking about, in my opinion, is the most important thing to do and to, to get to a point where you're not speculating about maybe it is or maybe it isn't. Okay. And that's, that's another one that doesn't, it's not a mark on, this is another one. So mark ons, is not a mold test. 
Marcon's, what that, those of you who may or may not know, Marcon stands for multi antibiotic resistant coagulase negative staph. That's why we just abbreviate it and say Marcon's. But it's a specific nasal swab that measures a type of staphylococcus that can inhabit your sinus cavities which is a common type of staph that some people have if they're immunosuppressed. Now mold is in it can cause immunosuppression, but it isn't the only thing that can cause immunosuppression. So when you have a positive mark on, it doesn't mean you're in mold. It's speculative, at best speculative, because a lot of people have coagulase negative staph in their sinus cavities, but are not in moldy environments. And so again, you can't use that test to justify, do I need to move out of my house? Do I need to pay thousands of dollars for mold remediation? I can't emphasize that enough, when, especially because mold is a major problem. I mean, mold is, in my opinion, um, you know, I go back in time 21 years ago when I first started practice and nobody had ever heard the term gluten sensitivity. And, you know, here, uh, not just myself, but myself and a, a small handful of other doctors across the world were really the ones that brought the attention to this area. And today, it's a household item. It's a household word. Everybody across the country, everybody in the world, for the most part, in industrialized countries, knows what gluten and gluten-free means. Even if their definitions are wrong, they still have heard the word. This is where we're going to be in the next 10 to 15 years with mold. We have terrible infrastructure. Um, we, have, we have basically an entire building industry, an entire industry has failed us in building homes that are safe and that keep uh, moisture out and that keep mold from growing. And so we have a huge infrastructure problem of homes where mold is growing and it has grown in them and is slowly just killing people over time. And we're gonna see more and more about this. Mark my words, I'm predicting the future. Um, in, in the next five to 10 years, you're gonna see and hear a lot more about toxic mold because it is a major, major health issue for many of you and you don't even know it yet. Okay. I did a cleanse protocol with food restricted to Ayurvedic herbs and whole grains for 10 days. My joint pain returned almost at once. I mean, if you were cleansing with whole grains, you, you probably did return. No grain, no pain. Um, go read it. It's very common for it to cause joint pain. And so if your cleanse was based on eating whole grains, it doesn't surprise me to see that your joint pain returned to you. And no, South Asian populations cannot tolerate grain, in my experience, better than others. I see just as many South Asian people have gluten sensitivity issues as I do Irish and English and Americans, etc. Okay, I think we're out of time. Yeah, I'm 22 minutes over. I'm hungry. I'm going to go home and eat. Hopefully, you're already at home and you can eat, eat something healthy and get a good night's sleep. And uh, hey, look, go and visit me at glutenfreesociety.org, especially if you want to get the show notes. The show notes are there. If you come over and visit, you can access them along with all the images and all the articles. Make sure you sign up for our newsletter. Uh, we won't spam you with a bunch of junk. We'll just give you great, solid information. Remember, our goal here is to save 100 million lives. So if you found tonight's show helpful, Please help us share this show with five other friends, 10 other friends. Let's get the word out that, that life change and diet change are the crux of good health and that you cannot have good health without those things. And together we can help save 100 million lives. Have a fantastic week. We'll see you next Monday. Take care. Hey, if you've got a functional medicine or health question that you'd like me to answer for you, make sure you send me an email, glutenology at gmail.com, and we'll do our best to create a video answer just for you. Have a great day.